Uh, welcome to this new module and uh, this module is on uh, query performance enhancing technique and so there are basically four uh, techniques that we are, we are going to discuss uh, under this module. Uh, the first technique is uh, aggregation so which, uh, which is the topic of today's lecture. Then it will be followed by <coughs> uh, partitioning which is another technique. The third one is uh, <coughs> view metalization and the fourth one is bitmap indexing so these are the four broad category or four broad techniques um, uh, major techniques for improving the uh, query performance in a data warehousing environment although there are many others but these are the ma major four techniques that we are going to discuss plus uh, we also use uh, uh, multi-dimensional databases to improve the performance of queries of certain kinds of queries in a data warehouse environment so Multi-dimensional databases will be taken up uh, once we have done OLAP, right? So that is another kind of uh, uh, a strategy that we use um, to um, improve the query performance. So let me start uh, today's topic, uh, that is aggregation, and uh, let me start by giving you a quote uh, given by Kimball, right? So he says that the single most dramatic way to affect performance in a large data warehouse is to provide a proper set of aggregate records. Uh, in some cases, speeding queries by a factor of 100 or even 1000. No such other means exist to harvest such spectacular gains. Right? So this explains that uh, the importance of this particular statement uh, by Kimball uh, highlights the importance of aggregates or aggregation in such as such so let us try to understand what what are these aggregates and how they play an important role in improving query performance by such uh, such factors like hundred and a thousand right so the speed up that we achieve is hundred times uh, right and thousand times in some cases so that is something uh, which uh, sounds unbelievable but uh, that is actually true and we'll try to see how uh, s uh, such gains can be achieved still uh, despite these spectacular gains that we can achieve uh, using aggregation still aggregation is so underused so first of all let me uh, let me tell you what uh, these aggregates are right so aggregation is like um, or aggregates are like uh, kind of summary of of data say for example like most of the queries in the data warehousing environment are are actually requiring some kind of aggregation like some count min max right so these are all aggregate functions so aggregate functions are basically the ones which take as input multiple records and uh, they output a single value right so that is what uh, we refer to as uh, aggregates right so in, in a data warehousing context aggregates basically mean that say so suppose you have a, a data warehouse a grocery store data warehouse where uh, you have daily sales records right so now from daily sales record suppose I have a query which requires monthly sales records of products so I have to aggregate from day the day data the daily granularity data to monthly uh, monthly data right so this is one kind of aggregation that we perform right so what we do to speed up such queries is that suppose I know that monthly aggregates are quite common or monthly aggregates are required so what I'll do is I'll pre-compute this aggregate, monthly aggregate with the respect to products. That is, each product in a particular month, how much it sold, right? So I'll, I'll aggregate the daily granularity records to form this aggregate and store it in my data warehouse, right? So that is a basic idea of aggregation. So let us now try to see why these aggregates are not so popular, right? <coughs> because we are not still comfortable with the idea of redundancy see whenever you when i whenever i uh, kind of aggregate any data say from daily data to monthly data i am introducing redundancy in my system is it not and uh, we have all come from the uh, from the 
uh, we have done all done a course on data uh, on uh, relational databases right and uh, there we see that uh, redundancy there we learn that redundancy is not such a good thing and uh, we should try to avoid redundancy at all costs and whatever data that can be derived should not be kept or should not be stored explicitly in the data in in the database right and we try to remove redundancy using uh, different techniques like normalization right so we we try to avoid redundancy so we we still have that uh, frame of, uh, of mind that redundancy is not a good thing and aggregates are nothing but uh, uh, aggregates do introduce uh, redundancy in the system so it requires extra space because i have the daily data with me but what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to store the monthly data also uh, somewhere in my in my data warehouse so it requires extra space and most of us are not sure of what aggregates to store so it is uh, uh, it is not possible that you store all possible aggregates uh, into your d in your data warehouse. You create all of them and pre-compute them and keep them in your data warehouse. So that is not always possible. So we have to do uh, we have to be judicious in what aggregates we store. So so that uh, we are not sure how to do that selection, right? So that is another kind of a problem associated, and there is a bizarre phenomena that. Uh, that occurs when we create aggregates and that is called as sparsity failure right so I'll, I'll be spending a lot of time on explaining this concept of sparsity failure right and uh, this is uh, another reason why people try to avoid aggregates in their data warehouse right? and uh, now let me just uh, try to give you uh, a comparison between aggregates and indexes so indexes all of you know Right, so indexes we use in relational databases to speed up uh, the retrieval of uh, of records. Right, so let me see. So are they analogous? So are they similar in in some sense? So, <coughs> so indi indexes what they do is they duplicate the information content of index columns. Say for example, if I create an index on on a particular <coughs> say for example ID number, if I create an index uh, on that. So I'll be doing what I'll be putting uh, some values of this uh, uh, some uh, ID numbers in an index so that I can suppose I'm trying to make a B tree index or B plus tree index on on the on the ID number. So what I'm doing is I'm taking s some of the values of that ID number and putting it in a data structure like a tree or an indexing structure, right? So I am doing some kind of duplication, not maybe not the complete duplication but a partial duplication of of uh, records or of values uh, that are there in that particular column right so indexes do that and we don't disparage this duplication as redundancy because um, uh, we don't crib about this or we don't uh, see this as a problem because uh, as a redundancy problem because of the benefits that we get out of an index so if you remove all indexes uh, from a database you can see that the performance of your database will go down, right? And uh, this is mainly because of the benefits that we achieve or that we get by creating indexes in terms of retrieval. At the same time, aggregates also duplicate the information content of aggregated columns, right? So they are, they are similar in, in, in that sense, right? And uh, <coughs> traditional indexes, what uh, they, are, they typically do is uh, they they try to uh, retrieve a small number of uh, records uh, uh, from the database uh, very quickly. Uh, <coughs> small number of qualifying records in OLTP systems or other traditional database systems. <coughs> in data warehouses, queries require millions of records to be summarized. So if I say, find the monthly sales of all products uh, in the month of uh, January 2015. So this would require millions and millions of records to be to be aggregated or to be summarized so this creates problems and uh, in such cases uh, it is a good idea that even if you have an index you bypass the index and perform table scans complete table scans because you are trying to retrieve most of the records that are there in the in the fact table right so uh, indexes do not uh, prove to be uh, useful when you are trying to capture most of the records 
in the in the table. <coughs> so, in terms of aggregates, uh, we need um, new indexes that can quickly and logically get us to millions of records. I am using the word logically here because we are not interested in each and every individual record, right? Like in case of traditional indexes uh, in a in a database, uh, conventional database environment, right? So here, what we are trying to do is, we don't, we are not interested in the in each and every individual record that uh, contributes to the aggregate. So we are interested mainly in in the value that comes out, right? So what is the say for the month of January 2015? What is uh, what is the amount generated by selling product P1? That is what we are interested in. So, logic uh, because we uh, need only the summarized result and not the individual record. This is what I just explained to you. And we sometimes call aggregates as summary indexes. So, they, they are basically they summarize the data and they are analogous to indexes. So, that is why we call them summary indexes. <coughs> and uh, one more kind of comparison say you know already that uh, in data marts uh, what we do is uh, we often keep uh, summarized data right so but these data marts are typically implemented in a separate database right or at a separate location but aggregates belong to the same database as the low level atomic data that is indexed right or that is summarized. So, this is a, a difference or some kind of comparison also with data marts and query should always target the atomic data. So, what I am trying to say by uh, in this uh, in this point is that the users should not be aware of what aggregates are there in the in the data warehouse. Because suppose I tell you that uh, I have this monthly aggregate, I have this yearly aggregate and so on so forth. So, if you start targeting directly the uh, the aggregates, then what will happen is suppose tomorrow due to some reason I, I decide to drop a particular aggregate and you have used that in your query or in the application that you have written or application code that you have written, then what happens is that uh, that object that aggregate will not be found and you will uh, your query would not execute right so you'll have to go back to your code and see then check what aggregates are available and then rewrite your query uh, you need you will need to rewrite your query so that those kind of problems can can arise so now what uh, is suggested or what is uh, what is the rule here is that you should always target the the atomic data okay so what this means basically is that uh, the queries or the the users are not aware of what aggregates exist in the in the system now the question arises the natural question arises that if i'm not using aggregates directly or explicitly in my queries so how do how would my query uh, exploit or leverage the aggregate so the answer to this is that there is a middleware called as aggregate navigation uh, <coughs> or navigator it should be navigator right so uh, aggregate navigator automatically rewrites queries to access the best possible available aggregate so what is this aggregate navigator right and uh, <coughs> how it works how it intercepts the queries and uh, makes them aggregate aware right so all those things will be discussed in today's lecture and uh, aggregate navigation is a form of query optimization. So, because when I rewrite my query or when I redirect my query to the aggregates, my queries uh, definitely would run faster by a factor of, as I said in the first slide, by a factor of uh, anywhere between 100 to 1000. So, it is a, it's a, it's a kind of a query optimization that is happening and <coughs> should be offered by database query optimizers and it is a piece of what we can say an intelligent middleware that sits between the users and the data warehouse and any query that is uh, issued by the user is intercepted by this middleware and then it uh, makes the query aggregate aware 
and then the query is actually executed on top of the aggregates. And then there are, th there are certain thumb rules of which uh, we should all follow when we try to work with aggregates. So, uh, suppose, uh, so before I uh, talk about this rule, right, so the as I said uh, that when you create certain aggregates to benefit certain queries, you, you need extra space, right. And you are always tempted to, uh, always tempted to create more and more aggregates, right. But there is a thumb rule which uh, kind of uh, uh, restricts uh, the number of aggregates that you can create. So, what it says is that size of the database should not become more than double of its original size. So, that is a kind of a thumb rule that we follow. So, suppose your uh, your data warehouse is 100, 100 gigabytes and now you start creating aggregates and then suddenly you realize that you have created so many aggregates that the size of the data warehouse has, is be has become somewhere uh, uh, between 200 and 220 gigabytes, right. So, this is something that we should try to avoid. So, the trade-offs uh, involved in aggregates in, uh, include query performance versus costs and what kind of costs we are talking about. So, let me just, uh, so the costs involved are that of storing. So, you need storage uh, space, right. Uh, you need um, cost of building the aggregates or creating the aggregates, cost of maintaining the aggregates. And when there are so many aggregates, you need some, some kind of administration. Uh, to administration, uh, <coughs> uh, some kind of administration is required to manage these uh, aggregates. So, <coughs> what we should uh, try to actually try to avoid when we create aggregates is that uh, a kind of an imbalance, right, or which is a kind of a very skewed imbalance, right. Uh, retail data warehouse that collapsed under the weight of more than 2500 aggregates and that took more than 24 hours to refresh. So, let me explain this. So, there was a retail da data warehouse and it had created, uh, so the administrator created around 2500 aggregates and uh, these aggregates like, uh, so you know the refresh uh, cycle, right. So, when you, uh, when you bring in the new data into the data warehouse, say every night you bring in the data, right. So, when you bring in the data, whatever aggregates are there, they need to be updated, right. So, what happened here was that there were 2500 aggregates and when we tried to aggregate them, uh, try to update them every night, so we found that it was taking us more than 24 hours to do that because aggregates would pose a kind of an overhead or they create an overhead on the ETL system because every aggregate that is present has to be updated uh, whenever new data comes into your data warehouse. So, what was found was that it was taking 24 hours to refresh all the aggregates that are present in the data warehouse and by the time you finish doing that, the next refresh is already due, right. So, you, you did not have any time to allow the users to use the data warehouse, right. So, this is what happened. So, we should avoid this kind of a situation. So, that is why query performance versus costs. So, all these costs have to be incorporated. So, sorry, I think there is some uh, uh, goof up with the animation, but no, that is fine. So, what we do is, uh, so there are certain guidelines that have been proposed. So, first of all, you need to set an aggregate store limit, a storage limit, right, not more than double the original size. This is the thumb rule that we discussed. And then the, the portfolio of aggregates should be dynamic because whatever aggregates you create today, right, or which are useful today may not be useful tomorrow because the query profiles or the query, uh, query workload has changed or evolved over a period of time. So, you need to keep taking, uh, uh, keep taking stock of the situation every, every, every regular intervals of time and see if there is a need to change the set of aggregates that you already have. And um, define small aggregates uh, 10 to 20 times smaller than the fact table or the aggregates on which it is based. So, <coughs> uh, in terms of size say you can 
think in terms of number of records. So, if you are uh, fact table at 100 records, right? So, your aggregated fact table should have only uh, <coughs> 10 records, something like that, 10 or 20 records, right? Or 10 or 5 records. Monthly product sales aggregate. So, how many times smaller than the daily product uh, uh, sales uh, table? So, the natural answer that we think is uh, is 30 because in a, in a month there are 30 days, right? So, if I am aggregating 30 records into one record, so it should be 30 times smaller, right? But the answer is not wrong, uh, answer is not 30, right? So, this answer is likely to be wrong and the reason behind this is sparsity failure. So, I have not introduced what is the sparsity failure, but uh, in due course of time I will do that. But keep in mind that whenever you create aggregates, this phenomena uh, can occur and uh, it basically leads to uh, uh, an unexpected data explosion, right. So, this uh, sparsity failure is, is about data exp uh, <coughs> no, uh, used. data explosion sorry so it, it needs to uh, kind of an unexpected data explosion so we should be really uh, careful about uh, this phenomena right and we should take all measures to to uh, handle this Now, let me move to the next slide. Oh, sorry. So, what you should basically do is uh, and let me clear the annotations. So, what we should basically try to do is uh, spread the aggregates. So, goal should be to accelerate a broad spectrum of queries and not just a few queries. So, <coughs> so this is a, a, <coughs> a figure, I am not sure about the source, so uh, that is why I have written, although when I, once I locate the source, I will put it here, right. So, this is a poor use of space allocated for aggregates. So, suppose you have set a limit that I want to create aggregates. Uh, 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 say in a space of around 10 GB. So, what I have done is I have created certain aggregates and you can see if you look at this brown portion here, right. So, aggregates less than 10 x faster than the base fact table. So, they are speeding up the queries by a factor of around uh, 10 or less. Then in this space I have a set of uh, uh, queries or set of aggregates that speed up the queries uh, by a factor of between 10 and 20. And then I have a smaller fraction of queries which uh, aggregates which speed up the queries by a factor of 21 to 100 and that is good. But, and I have very small uh, set of aggregates which occupy less space right. I mean the space uh, this is the pi right the space pi. So, you can see that they are occupying a very small amount of space, but they are able to uh, accelerate or speed up the queries by a factor of uh, something between 100 and, and 1000. But the more uh, worrying part in this uh, so in this kind of uh, allocated space is that this almost half the space is unused and that is uh, that uh, it tells us that you are not properly utilizing the space allocated to you. Right? It is just like we give you a budget every year and and you don't utilize it half of them is is left unutilized right so that kind of situation should not be there so that's why i'm saying that this is a poor use of of uh, space and moreover you can see that if i just remove this this whole thing from here right so you are using only this this much space right this th the two green ones the light green and the dark green space uh, to speed up queries by a factor of above 20 right. So, most of the space is used for very little gains that is what makes this allocation a poor allocation right. 
And now this is another very interesting, uh, let me first clear the annotation so that. Now this is a very very uh, interesting uh, mm, kind of uh, study by uh, uh, Neil Raden, right. So you can refer to this article, I have given the link here. So in this you see uh, there are two things that are <coughs> compared, one is the excuse me on the on the left axis left y axis right that is indicated in red there is a database size right and on the right uh, axis right y axis uh, which is uh, here right which is blue that indicates the relative query cost okay and here on this side is the database size and uh, on the x axis we have the number of aggregates. So, you can see and there are two curves one is red which indicates the database size and the other in blue is the ag average query cost. So, we have a, a set of query q right which we execute using the aggregates that are available and we measure the query cost and uh, we execute each and every query in the set q and then we find out the average query time right or average query cost. So, now what you do here is that you see that as we increase the number of aggregates the size of the database keeps on increasing it goes keeps going up right ok, but is the query cost going down in the same proportion. So, you can see that as we start creating aggregates the query cost goes down, but it kind of becomes uh, stable or not stable uh, it becomes uh, stagnant after some time. So, what I am saying is that after a point there is no visible benefit of storing more and more aggregates. I getting this. So, the <coughs> the best uh, that you can get. So, if you are very keen on um, improving query performance. So, if I cut this graph here somewhere here right. So, I create 40 aggregates. So, my query is uh, query cost the average query cost is, is pretty low here and the size of the database is also like not too much like 4000 units. Okay, or if I can if I can't afford that 4000 so I can try to cut it here somewhere right where my space is like just below 4000 and I've created only uh, only 21 aggregates but my query cost has gone down right okay so this is always a trade off between the size of the data warehouse right or the space requirement and the query response times ok. So, hope uh, this is clear to you. So, let me now move to the next slide ok. So, issues with aggregates are which aggregates to create, uh, how to guard against sparsity failure which is nothing but uh, an unexpected data explosion when you create aggregates and uh, <coughs> then how to store them. So, there are two approaches so basically one is a new fact table approach which is the recommended approach and there is a new level field approach where we keep a level field in the same table right as the as the original data, but this is typically not recommended and you will not find uh, too much material on this approach. So, we are we are not going to talk too much about this right. So, this is uh, kind of striked off and um, the next question is or next issue rather is that how queries are redirected to appropriate aggregates and as I told you there is a kind of a middleware called as aggregate navigator which I am going to talk about in detail right <coughs> which would help us in uh, redirecting the queries to appropriate aggregates. So, before I, I talk about that let me give you an example of um, what kind of aggregates we can actually create right and uh, <coughs> I will again take the grocery store um, uh, example 
okay or the case study and I'll focus only on three dimensions like product location and time there are around 10,000 products 1,000 stores 100 time periods and the sparsity is 10 percent so I'll, I'll explain each one of these uh, terms as we go along so total number of records is 100 million so how do you arrive at that so you have uh, from one store so one store how much you are selling per day right so uh, you have 10,000 products okay and uh, <coughs> each day so each day how much you are selling okay so i am saying that sparsity is 10 percent that means out of these 10,000 products i am selling only 10 percent of these products on a, any given day and uh, <coughs> this is each day right and so this is how much i sell now if i multiply this by 100 right that is 100 time periods so time period could be say if it is one day one time period is one day so this is how much uh, i'll be <coughs> selling from one store and how many stores i have 1000 so if you solve this you get what is 100 million records okay so we say that at the base level uh, we have 100 million records in the in the fact table Okay. Now let me talk about certain hierarchies. Uh, so, thousand products are spread over two thousand uh, categories, right? So that is what. So there is one hierarchy: product to categories, right? So products are ten thousand, and categories are two thousand. So, on an average in one category there are 5 products, then 100 stores in uh, 1000 stores, this is a, uh, a hierarchy along the along the store dimension, sorry state, where is the eraser, ok I will just cut it off. So, in store we have uh, how many thousand stores and spread over 100 districts, sorry 100, 100 states sorry, no sorry 100, uh, this is districts I am sorry. Okay, so 100 districts, so on an average in one district there will be how many stores, 10. So, I am just uh, uh, keeping a tag on this and 30 aggregates in 100 time periods right so say suppose uh, 100 time periods so time period is here and whatever is the next uh, level right so there are 30 aggregates so each aggregate so 100 is like 3.33 okay on an average okay so keep an eye on these numbers like 5, 10 and 3.33 ok. So let me now move to the next slide. So how many aggregates are possible? So I am now trying to define these aggregates. Uh, so there is one uh, aggregate called as category by one way. So category by store by day. So I will highlight uh, the one that I have uh, aggregated along. So you can see in place of product I have category. So I am aggregating along the uh, along the product dimension. Then I have one way, another one way. So here I am doing it with respect to district. So instead of store, I am using district. Then in the next one, I am doing it by say day to month. So if I have hundred uh, days, so right, so three months, right. Then I'll have two days, or uh, sorry, two way aggregates. So here I am doing it with respect to category and district then uh, this is category by month another two way so that would be district by month so, and then there will be a three way aggregate that will be category district and month and similarly if you have say categories are uh, rolled up to departments then you have another set of hierarchies then the aggregates would increase right 
but I am saying we are moving just one level uh, along the hierarchy. So, these are the seven aggregates that are there and plus we have the base table right. So, there are three dimensions. So, basically total aggregate should be 2 to the power 3 that is 8. So, let me clear this. Uh, So, what is sparsity? So, now I am trying to explain the concept of sparsity failure. So, for that we need to first understand what we mean by sparsity here. So, sparsity basically uh, comes from the fact that fact tables are sparse in their keys like I talked about 10 percent sparsity right. So, what this means is that, so if you have the fact table with you right. So, fact table, so total number of products are 10,000, but since the sparsity is 10 percent, only 1000 of them right 10 percent of 1000 or 10,000. So, that is how much? Uh, 1000. So, only 1000 product keys will be there out of a total of 10,000 in the in the fact table right. So, that is why we see say that the fact table is sparse in their keys and same thing applies for other other dimensions. So, 10 percent uh, sparsity as base level means that only 10 percent of the products are sold on any given day on an average. It is not that uh, on every day you will sell only 10 percent of the products right, but on an average you will somewhere you will may sell 20 percent, some day you may sell 5 percent, some day you may sell 12 percent and so on, but on an average it is like this. So, as we move from base level to one way, the sparsity values would increase right. So, the answer to this is it increases right. So, let me try to explain this concept why this increases. Say when you move from base to one, one way, suppose I am selling so, I, and so this is day 1, this is day 2 and uh, this is day 30. So, this is the month right. So, this these are this these are days in a month. So, I am selling 10 percent products here ok, 10 percent here and 10 percent here and you uh, it is very easy to see that whatever 10 percent I am storing here uh, selling here I must be selling a different set of 10 percent products on day 2. It is not that I will sell the same set of 10 percent products every day. So, suppose uh, I have 10 products right total uh, sorry 100 products ok and I am selling uh, say 10 percent. So, 10 products I am selling right. So, those products let it be 1, 2, 3 up to 10 this is day 1 right. On day 2 I am selling another 10 percent. So, I am saying I am selling products like 5 to uh, uh, 15 ok right. So, if I take and uh, day 3 I am selling another set right. So, these sets may have overlaps with each other, but they are not they are very unlikely to be the same. So, when so suppose I sold say day 2 I sold 5 to 15. So, over day 1 and day 2 if I look at it I have sold products from 1 to 15. So, at each individual day the sparsity was 10 percent right as we saw, but if I combine d 1 and d 2 the sparsity has gone from 10 uh, gone up from 10 percent to how much 15 percent. Because I have sold over the 2 days I have sold 15 different products right. So, the sparsity increases as we move up uh, the hierarchy right along any of the dimensions. So, what effect sparsity <coughs> would have on the on the size of the aggregated fact table. Uh, so, I hope you understand this concept that as we move from the base level to one way or two way aggregates right the the sparsity is going to go up right. Another way of looking at it is that suppose I will take only day 1, but I move to all stores in a particular district. Suppose there are 10 stores in a district and if I look at what products I sold from store 1, what products I, uh, I sold from store 2 and so on. 
So there would be definitely, if I take a union of all these products, so it will be definitely more than 10%, right? So there's another way of looking at it, right? So let me clear this. So let us assume that sparsity for one-way aggregates is say 50 percent. I mean these are just numbers. I, I could have worked with some other number also, right? The only uh, thing is that as we move from base to one-way to two-way to three-way, the sparsity is going to go up. And so much so that when we talk about uh, three-way aggregate, the sparsity could be 100 percent, right? So, what I mean by this is that if I look at, so here we are working with three dimensions, right? Products, uh, location, that is store and time. So, what I am saying is, if I look at, instead of products, if I look at categories, right? Instead of uh, individual stores, if I look at districts, In terms of time, if I instead of looking at days, I look at months. So, then it means that at this level of aggregate, this is a three way aggregate, I would have sold products from all the categories over a period of one month from all the stores in a, in a district. So, if I look at the data of all the stores in a particular district, right, over a period of month of a month, then I would have sold a product, at least one product from each category, right. So, this is what we mean by 100 percent sparsity. I hope this is clear. So, that means all the categories would be involved at this level of aggregate, right. So, I have just explained this. So, the answer to this is yes, all right. So, now uh, let me uh, give you this example. I have worked out one example for you. <coughs> So, you can see this is the example that the running example that I am taking. So, we had uh, the first, uh, so I will try to use different colors. So, uh, this is my, let me see if what options are. Mm. to increase the thickness of this. Okay. Anyway, so I am not able to do that, so that is fine. So, you can see that this is the base level record. So, I will just highlight it like this. So, you can see there are 100 million records. If I do one way, so I have put and plugged in all the numbers and this is the sparsity that I have worked out. I said one way is 50 percent, two way it is uh, 80 percent and three way it is 100 percent. So, this is okay. yeah. So, you can see that when I create these aggregates, right. So, this is just simple multiplication. So, I keep on multiplying this with this and with this, this is 50 percent, that means I will write 50 by 100. So, when I do this, I get 100 million records, right. So, this is simple uh, calculation and when I do at go at the 100, uh, 100 percent sparsity, that is a three way aggregate. So, I get a number that is 6 million, okay. <coughs> so, now, if I add all of these, right. I started off with 100 million and now I have got 494 million, right, records starting with 100. So, this is almost like 400 percent increase, right, on the uh, in terms of the number of records that I have. So, how, why this is happening? This is highly unexpected that if I create only these 6, 7 aggregates, right, I am getting a size uh, that is almost like five times the original size, right. So, let us try to understand why this is happening, okay. So, first thing is that 
I want you to focus on a couple of uh, records or couple of aggregates in this. So, I will mark them with red. So, that um, so first aggregate is this itself. Okay. This one way here and we are here aggregating with respect to products. So, this is one way. Another one is this one the next one or maybe the, the third one let me do that one way. So, this one again you can see 100 million, 100 million. So, the bigger uh, aggregates I am focusing on 50 million is also big. So, 50 million also you can see one way. So, this is with respect to the store yeah and this is 50 million and then I have a two way aggregate that is again very big that is 48 million. So, the here I have done it with respect to this and with respect to this right. So, now if you remember right. So, we what is the ratio between the product and the categories is 5. So, here the ratio is 5 this here the ratio is 10 when they talk about 100 stores in a particular district and in time periods this ratio is 3.3 right. So, does this give you some idea that when the ratio is less right. So, you can see the size is very high if this ratio is slightly better say 5 you get 100 million which is much less than 100 million. Oh, sorry, much less than 150 million. And when this ratio is say 10, its size is 50 million. Okay. So, what would have happened if these ratios, these numbers were higher than what they are now? So, instead of say 3.3, .3, if I say that this number was 15 or 20, right, say if I assume say 20 for each, okay, so then this value would have been much less right. So, the, the number of records would have been much less. So, what I am trying to say is that this aggregate that is 100 million, this 150 million and this 48 million even if I just ignore the 10 wala, 10, uh, 10 uh, ratio right. So, these 3 records totally contribute to like how much 250, 300 million. So, if I remove these 3 aggregates from my system. So, I less around 300 uh, million records right. So, that makes it so from 500 it becomes uh, 194 million records and this is less than 2 times the size of the original database that is 100 million. So, why so that this kind of a uh, uh, explosion of data that we saw here is called as sparsity failure. So, that is what I am trying to highlight in the next slide. So, an increase of almost 400 percent. So, why it happened? So, for that I told you the reason that uh, aggregate look at aggregations involving location where the ratio is uh, say uh, uh, location and time no this should be product sorry not location product and time mainly that. So, product the ratio is 5 and for time the ratio is 3.3. So, how can we control this aggregate explosion or data explosion? So, what I am saying is instead of uh, doing the calculations right with the um, 5. Uh, so, we had uh, 10,000 products. So, I will write it again here. We had 10,000 products and 2,000 categories to begin with. So, this ratio was 5. Now, what I am saying is instead of uh, 2000 work with only 500 categories. So, this ratio becomes 20 and we had 100 time periods and we are saying 5 time aggregates. So, earlier we had uh, how much uh, 30. So, this was 30 time periods. So, this ratio was 3.3 I am now saying 100 and uh, use only 5 time periods. So, this ratio is also like 20. So, if I redo these calculations with these uh, modified categories and uh, time aggregates I get only 210 with all possible aggregates right. So, this has reduced the the size of uh, the uh, uh, space requirements of the aggregates right. So, if I remove just one like 50 million right. So, 
so I am well within the limit. So if I you know, so this would be 160 million records approximately, right? So that will be very much within the limits. Okay. <coughs> so the thumb rule or the design principle for aggregates is that each aggregate must summarize at least 10 and preferably 20 or more lower level items. So if that is the case, then we can take care of sparsity failure. So I hope you have understood uh, the concept of sparsity failure, right? <coughs> and uh, so always try to uh, aggregate data in such a way that you aggregate at least 20, at least uh, at least 10, 10 we say, and preferably 20 or or more lower level items into the into the aggregate. So that would take care, as we saw in the previous uh, slide here that once we did this, so this was now 20, this ratio is now 20, right, as you can see, and this ratio is also 20. This ratio remains 10, so that is why still it is 50 million, okay. So had it, had this been also uh, 20, so this would have become 25 million, right, and so another 25 million gone from this, so minus 25 million, so this would have given me how much, uh, 185 million right which is well within the limit so uh, i'll uh, stop uh, this uh, break this lecture here and i'll continue with this uh, in the next class where i'm going to next lecture where i'm going to talk about uh, how do we store aggregates and what is aggregate navigation and uh, how it works and how it is helping you to redirect queries from uh, uh, redirect uh, queries to the appropriate aggregates. So, that I will take up in the next uh, lecture. Thank you.